Amen. Let's pray together this morning. Our Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us to be in this place together as your church. Thank you that we can gather this morning under the blood of Jesus Christ, that it was Christ who redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Thank you, Father, that we are no longer slaves to sin, no longer on our own. Thank you that we have life, that your word is life. Teach us now, Father. Give us understanding. Lead us in your way. Draw our hearts to you. Turn our eyes from looking at worthless things. Help us this morning to fix our gaze on you. God, we need you. We need your word. Open our ears. Open our eyes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 27 this morning. Acts chapter 27. As we are in week 54 of walking through Acts. One more week next week. So I hope to encourage you to be here. And uh, we'll finish out uh, the book of Acts uh, together. Acts 27. Just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to read all 44 verses together. If you're able to stand, we'll do that in just a moment. You know, life is hard. Acts 27 is another proof of it in Paul's life. No matter who we are, we all experience difficulty. To be sure, you know, the degree of life's severity differs from person to person. And there's some reasons, some real reasons that we know and that we can see why life is hard. Life is hard because the world is broken. Nothing is as it really should be because as as a creation, we have rejected God and we have rejected his goodness. But life is also hard because we are sinners. So as a, a humanity, as a people, creation rejected the creator but also life is hard because we are sinners we make bad decisions we make bad decisions accidentally sometimes we make bad decisions willfully and these choices make our lives a lot harder but life is also hard because God is good many of life's difficulties are actually by God's design I know we think about that and for some that doesn't make sense at all like what God wants to make our life difficult the truth that we see in scripture over and over again and even what we'll see today is that God uses hard things in the life to make us strong and to make us more into the image of his son and what we come to learn and and understand through Jesus Christ is that God is greater than every hardship and he is victorious over every pain There's coming a day where there'll be no more hardship. There's coming a day where there'll be no more pain. There's coming a day when you no longer have to argue with your toddler. (laughs) Praise be to God. Or your teenager. There's coming a day when your body will no longer suffer. I sat with some of our senior adults this week at different places. They're now allowing us in and to see how disease has affected the bodies of good believers in Christ. To know there's a day that they'll not wrestle with that anymore. There's coming a day, but we know that today there is hardship. There is difficulty. What do we make of those things? That's what I want us to wrestle with this morning. So if you're able to stand our respect for God's word, we're going to be reading Acts 27 verses 1 through 44. If you're not able, we understand and we know this is a little bit lengthy. Um, I pray this morning for our own hearts. I pray that we would see God's word, that we would bend our lives towards it. May God help us do that this morning. In Acts 27, this is the reading of the word beginning in verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Andromedium, which was about to sail to the, to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, 
And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out the sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of uh, Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Canidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to the place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Kata, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they drew the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding again and found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for the day to come. And as the the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all. He broke it and began to eat. Then all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and let, left them in the sea, and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Why did Luke go to such lengths to describe the details of this event? At first glance, it doesn't seem to fit into his purpose. But part of Luke's reason may be that the details reveal just how distressing 
this experience actually was for Paul and for others. You know, against the human helplessness of this frightening adventure stands the sovereign hand of God who promised Paul that he would testify in Rome. We saw that promise back in Acts 23, verse 11. And since an angel repeats that promise to Paul here in the midst of the storm, in verse 24 we see that, Luke's main purpose is to show that God's purpose cannot be stopped, even by such powerful forces of wind and storm and water and nature. Also, Luke shows Paul's calm, really practical leadership in the midst of of this crisis. Even though he was a, a prisoner, Paul is the dominant figure in this chapter. Because of him, all 276 people on board the the ship were saved from death. And so Paul's testimony, both of his calm demeanor and by his words, would have had an unforgettable impact on the people that were on that ship with him. Even if you've never been uh, in a storm at sea, you have been and will be in many storms in in life. I can remember fishing with my, my grandfather Uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, and we were uh, catching sand sharks when I was just a little kid. But I remember that boat rocking back and forth, and man, my stomach was was churning. I I could not, I could barely stand it, honestly, to be able to stand up and hold the fishing pole. I can't imagine with the the waves going back and forth, the ship being tossed in to and fro, and, and for these people to feel like their life was threatened. Many of us maybe haven't been on a boat like that, but we know that we go through difficulty in all of our lives. We know that we go through distressing periods of time in life, distressing seasons. But yet God is in control, yet God is sovereign over the storms of life. Paul's experience teaches us that. And what I want us to see is that if we will trust in God's sovereign care for us in life's storms, he will then use us to bear witness to many people, just like he does in Paul's life. And so there's three main points I just want you to see from this text, and probably a lot of sub-points you'll hear, but uh, three main things. Number one, God is sovereign over the storms of your life. God is sovereign over the storms of your life. You know, the biblical doctrine of God's sovereignty over all things is one of the most practical truths for us to apply in times of trial. There's some things that we see within this text that that teaches us about God's sovereignty. One of them is that when life is out of your control, it's never out of God's control. That no matter what you're in, no matter if you're on sea or land, when, when your life is out of control, God is never out of control. The ship was out of control. In verses 15 through 20, it describes what they were going through, what they were experiencing, how they were at the mercy of this fearsome storm. The power of the wind and and the waves in such a storm is, is awesome. And the people on that ship were completely out of control, and, and they were helpless. There wasn't anything that they could do to right the ship. There wasn't anything that they could do to calm the waves. And God allowed Paul to be there. God, if not anything, put Paul to be there. Now, this is the amazing thing. At the end of chapter 26, if, if you read that last week, in fact, let's just look at that for just a second. At the end of 26, it's not going to be on the screen, so just look in your Bibles. Um, you see in verse 30, 31, and 32, you, you see Agrippa, and, and you see Festus talking, and they said, basically, they said this. If Paul ha- had not, what, appealed to Caesar he would have been set free. So, so basically, at the end of 26, uh, Agrippa and Festus would have, would have let Paul go, but Paul appealed to Caesar. Put me before Caesar. Now think about that for a moment. Because at the end of 26, basically, they were saying Paul could have walked free, but Paul opened his mouth, and now he's headed towards Rome. But in Acts 23, 11, Jesus told him as he stood next to Paul, you will make it to Rome to testify of me there. Now, who put Paul on the ship? God did. Yeah, I I know it takes human responsibility to get on that ship, but God wanted him on that ship. 
And God knew before the ship ever left port that it was going to begin to face difficulty. So God allowed and put Paul in the midst of difficulty, in a place where everything seemed out of control, but God was uh, completely in control. You know, they did everything that they could to keep the ship from breaking apart. In verse, verse 17, um, it, it, says, it says there that after hoisting it up, they, they used supports to, to undergird the ship. They, they were doing everything within their own responsibility and, and, and care to make sure that this ship was not going to break apart. They were using everything they had. It's interesting there. There was nothing they could do. You know, verse 20, they had, they had no compass, they had no instruments. Uh, in verse 20, they couldn't see the, the sun or the stars. They were lost in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. They, they were fearful that they might drift to the south. They might drift 350 miles to the south where the, the dangerous sandy reefs were. They, they knew uh, about this off the, the coast of, of Sirtis or, or Libya, basically. And so in verses 18 and 19, they dumped a lot of the cargo, even the, the non-essentials of the ship's tackle. But even after doing all of that, they were not in control. But God was in control. He always is. This storm did not take him by surprise. He, he was not in heaven in a panic, summoning his angels to come up with some kind of rescue plan for Paul. God caused the boat to drift 476 miles from the small uh, island of Cotta to, to Malta. Another speck in really that vast sea. Although the sailors were not in control, God was. When everything in your life feels like it's out of control, God is never out of control. Also, we see from this text that being in a storm doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. I mean, you might be sitting here this morning and you find yourself in a real storm of life, and just because you're in that storm, it does not mean that you are out of God's will. So sometimes when we find ourselves in the midst of a sudden storm in life, we, we wonder if, if we've done something wrong. We, we wonder if there's some sin that's unconfessed. We, we wonder if we brought ourselves into this storm. But just because you're facing troubles... And struggles and difficulties, it doesn't mean you're out of God's will. We, we may be at times, especially, uh, you know, we may have gotten ourselves into the storm at times because of sin. That's one thing. But here, Paul is being obedient to God. He's trusting God. He's getting on the boat. In fact, you see in the beginning of the chapter, uh, it says in, in 27.1, and when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, Luke is now with Paul once again. And so it's Luke, Paul, and Aristarchus. They are all together, and they're on this ship. They were on that ship in obedience to the government, in submission to the government, but God was using it as the means, the ship, the storm, and everything, to get to Rome where he would stand and give witness to Jesus Christ. And so sometimes you may wonder, because of the difficulty, am I in God's will? But we may be exactly where God wants us to be. The, the Lord had told Paul that he would testify uh, for him in Rome, but he had not bothered to mention the little detail, really, uh, of the storm or the coming shipwreck or anything that he was going to face. We don't always get all the details, but God is in control. God is in control of the storm. And so if you find yourself in difficulty this morning in a storm, it doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. In Matthew 14, 22, uh, it shares how Jesus, after feeding the 5,000, he made the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. The word made there, it's not on your screen. You can turn there if you want, Matthew 14, 22. The word made, which means to compel by, by force or, or persuasion, shows that the disciples didn't have much say in whether to get on the ship or not. It says that Jesus made them to get onto the ship. And what happened? They sailed into a storm. 
Who put him in that storm? Jesus did. Who comes to them walking on water? Jesus does. What was Jesus trying to teach them? That even Jesus has power over the storms, over the water, over the winds. He wanted to teach them. And so even though they were in a fierce storm, they were precisely in the will of God. It was precisely where God wanted them in that moment of time. The, the point is, is that, that God's will for his children sometimes includes storms. Don't be surprised. But another thing that we learn, especially from, from this text, is that being in a storm doesn't mean that you're out of God's care. So yeah, it's kind of connected to, okay, I'm in the storm, I'm not out of God's will, but also being in the storm doesn't mean that I'm out of, out of God's care. Even, even though the sailors did not know where they were and had no control over the situation, God knew exactly where they were. God knows exactly where you are. He's not surprised that, that you're at 115 West 5th Street. He's not surprised in the, in this, about the, the, the seat that you are sitting in. He, he's not surprised by any of that. He knows exactly where you are. And so you are never off of God's radar. You know, Paul was not off of God's radar. He cared for them. You know, the people that are around him didn't even know that he existed. Right? But because he was caring for Paul and Luke and Aristarchus, we see that he's caring for all of them that are on board. You know, if you are God's child through faith in Christ, you can be assured that he cares for you in every storm that you walk into, every storm that you find yourself in. He takes you through. You know, Peter, Peter combines God's sovereignty and his care when he tells us in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, and it's going to be on the screen. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, uh, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So God's sovereignty over everything that happens is a source of, of great comfort for the believer in, in the storms of life. But God's sovereignty never negates our responsibility. To, to conclude that since God is sovereign, whatever will be will be, and thus to kick back and, and to do nothing, that is not biblical whatsoever. Let go and let God. No, not really. God has called you to be responsible for what he has put in your hands. And you have a duty to be obedient with what he has given you. And so first off, we saw this morning that God is sovereign over the storms of life. The second thing I want you to see is that our duty in the storms of life is to have confidence in God's keeping of us. Our duty in the storms of life is to have confidence in God's keeping of us. Our text again shows us this. You know, confidence in God's keeping is not opposed to, to using wisdom and common sense. And so because God cares for you, because God is, is keeping you, because God is watching over you, that is not up against you using the wisdom and the mind and the brain and the common sense that, that he gave you to use in the midst of it. Paul was a man of great faith, and he specifically testifies that he believes God is in this trial. He says that in verse 25. Look at that. He says, so take heart, man, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. God is in the midst of this trial, friend. Take heart. Have courage. Trust. Trust that God is in the midst of this. So we can assume that he was trusting God in verse 10 when he advised the men in charge not to continue with the trip due to the lateness in the year. You notice it says in verse 9, the fast, it refers to the, the Day of Atonement, which was in early October that year. Any time after September 14th was really risky to sail. There was something that was known about the Mediterranean. So any time after that date, it was advised not to go. Not, don't do it. And no one really ever sailed after November 11th until the end of winter because of the frequent storms. And so we need to, to know uh, and, and need to really not assume that Paul had, 
had a revelation from God warning him about the storm. Rather, he was just using common sense. And so he knew, you know, as someone who was on ships, he had been in uh, other shipwrecks, right? Three times Corinthians says that he was in a shipwreck. Him, by just being on the water, had some common sense about what they should and shouldn't do. And I believe he was speaking up from that common sense, like, don't do it. I mean, just like you with your kids, you speak up many times with just wisdom and common sense, like, that wasn't wise, or you shouldn't do that, or if you do that, this is what you can expect. I mean, why? Because you've lived life. Paul's lived life. He's, he's been on the water. He, he knows what they're going to face. And so he was using common sense. He was using wisdom. He'd been in many shipwrecks including a night and day spent drifting in the deep. That's more experience than I have. You know, but the, the pilot and the ship owner did not like the, the harbor of Fairhaven for the winter, and, and along with the centurion, decided to try to make the 40 miles to Phoenix. And so what happened is the moderate wind that came up fooled them into supposing that they had gained their purpose, and so they launched off into what would shortly become a major disaster. And so, so much for expert opinion, right? They didn't listen at all to Paul. But the point is, is that there was nothing wrong with Paul's using good judgment and common sense. Sometimes people imply that trusting the Lord necessarily means casting reason to the wind and, and doing something absurd. Now, sometimes the, the, the Lord does expect us to do something by faith that those in the world consider foolish because they do not trust in God themselves. But we better be sure that it is the Lord that is behind such things or we end up looking awfully stupid to the world around us. Trusting God and using your brain are not necessarily opposed to one another. God expects both. God expects you to use wisdom. God expects you to, to think through situations. And so, so confidence in God's keeping is not opposed to, to using wisdom and common sense. What we also see from this is that confidence in God's keeping means we will be different than others in the midst of the storm. How many of you know someone else? I'm not asking you about yourself. How many of you know someone else who's going through a storm? Hold your hand up high. Look around. Look around. Seriously, look around. We all know someone who's going through a storm. We have an opportunity in the midst of storms to look different than the world looks. This is significant. Paul stands out about, above all the others in this desperate situation because of his calm faith in God. Now, now let's be clear. It seems that for a while even Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus lost hope and were fearful because what does Luke state in verse 20? Look, look at verse 20 for, for just a second. Verse 20 it says there, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. They had come to a place to accept that they may not get out of this storm. To some degree, in verse 20, that they lost some hope. It wasn't until later on that we see in verse 24 that that the, in 23 and 24, that the angel comes to him and the angel reassures him. And so, so we can even see that they thought that hope was lost. In verse 24, the angel says, do not be afraid. What does that imply? It implies that Paul was, what? Afraid. Do we have a, a proper fear in the midst of our own storms of, of life, a, a proper respect and awe for, for God in the midst of it? Do we, do we see that, you know what, it may not be that God does this, it may not be that, that God saves me, but I will worship him anyway. It may not be that the end of the story goes the way that I want it to go. And that's the, the fact of life over and over is the tension is this, that we want to be the author of our own story. We, we know perfectly how it, should, how it should turn about. But God knows better. And it'll be for his glory. It'll be for your good. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. I mean, what's the first word in that, in that phrasing? 
all. A shipwreck works for, for, for our good? Uh, you know, difficulty, sickness, cancer, death, struggle works for my good? I know, we can't see it all, can we? Because once and again, we're not God. Do we trust him? Is our faith really in God? Are we really in his hands? Listen, when we are overwhelmed by ca- ca- uh, catastrophe or, or difficulty, uh, you know, even the strongest people of faith can doubt. Even the, the strongest people of faith can have fear. But what do we do with, with that fear? We run to God. We cling to God. We trust in God. But the angel reminded him of God's earlier promise that he would bear witness in Rome. And so he also promised Paul that all on board would be saved. So Paul stood up and reminded them of his earlier warning. Not just to say, I I told you so, but really to, to establish his credibility. And then Paul goes on to give them a word of encouragement concerning God's promise. Later, Paul encouraged them all to eat some food so that they would have the strength to get to the shore. And when he did that, in verse 34, he openly, he openly thanks God for the food before he ate it. He's thanking God amongst unbelievers. It didn't matter. He didn't quietly say, say a prayer in the corner. No, he stands up and he, he prays, openly thanking God, unashamedly showing these rough sailors and, and soldiers and, and fellow prisoners that they too can trust in God. We're going to make it through because of my trust, our trust in God. You know, if we want to stand out in a time of trial from, from those who do not know the Lord, we've got to have a daily walk of seeking God before the trials actually hit. Too many Christians only come running to God in the midst of crisis. I've seen this time and time again, where there's a crisis that hits, and them and God are like this. But you know what? Two months, three months, four months out from that crisis, they're no longer like this. They slowly drift back to their old patterns of life. I don't know if you're in the midst of struggle, storm, trial, difficulty right now. But where are you with Christ? Are you only going to run to Christ when Struggle comes, or are you walking with him now? If we want to stand out in a time of trial from those who do not know the Lord, we've got to have a a daily walk. In Proverbs 1, verses 24 through 29, wisdom personified, wisdom warns us. What does it warn, warn us of? It warns us that if we refuse to seek her during normal times, if we refuse wisdom when everything else is good, she will laugh at us. When our dread comes like a storm and when distress and anguish come upon us. Take a look at that. Uh, Proverbs 1 verses 24 through 29. So good. Are we trusting in wisdom? Are we trusting in God's way when everything is normal? Because if we only come running to it when, when things are difficult, wisdom just laughs at us. But if we daily seek God and his wisdom during normal times, when a a storm hits, we will be different than those that are in the world because we know and trust our God. That God can handle the storms. God can handle it. But we see something else within this, and it's this, that confidence in God's keeping is not opposed to using the means that God gives to get us out of the storm. So trusting in God's keeping, right? We have confidence in in God's keeping. It's not opposed to using the means, what God puts in our hands to get out of the storm. So so it's not that I'm just trusting God. I'm trusting in God's care. He's keeping me, and so I'm just going to sit back, and and, and I don't have to do anything. No, God has put some means into your hands, and, and God wants you to use those means to get out and help yourself get out of the storm. The angel promised Paul that everyone on board would be saved. That's verse 24. But during the final night, the sailors were trying to escape from the ship in the the little dinghy, right? 
They, they thought that they could lower down the dinghy. I mean, the storm is crazy. And they're thinking, you know what? We could lower the smallest boat that we got into the water. And we could escape on that boat and we'll make it. Notice what it said. Everyone had to stay together for them to be saved. That's what the promise was. So if guys get out of the boat and get into the dinghy, what did they not do? They did not follow the, the angel of the Lord. They did not follow what was prescribed for them. And so that's what's happening in this passage in verse 30. And so, so under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow in verse 30, Paul saw what was happening. And he realized that those that were on board needed the sailor's expertise to get to land in the morning. They couldn't go. We got to keep them, right? So he said to the centurion in, in, in verse 31, if you notice what it says there, he, Paul is speaking to the centurion. He says, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So Paul speaks up, right, in that moment. By now, the, the centurion had, had come to respect Paul's wisdom, and so he ordered his soldiers to cut the lines to the ship's boat. They, they cut and let the dinghy go, right? So now the sailors couldn't escape. So Paul realized that for everyone to be saved, they also needed strength. So first, Paul is using what God has given him, wisdom and discernment, to keep the guys in the boat, but also he notices how weak these guys are. And what does he encourage them to do? He encourages them to eat. So none of them had eaten following the, the two weeks, and so due to sickness and perhaps due to the difficulty of preparing food, they had nothing. And so he took bread, gave thanks, in verses 34 through 36, we see him giving thanks, and we see him giving out the bread, and, and they all ate it, and he is doing what? He is encouraging them and telling them that the food given to them was for their preservation. Now here's where it hits, right? In other words, although God promised that everyone would be preserved alive, Paul did not assume that it would happen apart from the use of, of proper means, of the mind, of the hands, of the bread. He, he realized the proper means that, were, that was in his hand and also in his mind, he used those things for God's glory. And so Paul didn't assume that he would just be saved apart from what God gave him. The, the sailors could not escape and everyone needed the strength that came from eating. In the same way, God has promised that some from every tribe and tongue and people and nation will be in heaven. But is that just going to happen? No, God calls us to go and, and, and take the gospel, right? God calls us to go to the nations and preach the, the good news of Christ. And so, yes, God promised that that. A representative of every tribe will be in heaven around the throne. But we need to pray. And we need to give. And, and we need to send. And we need to go. And we need to declare the gospel. God is sovereign to save his people. But he, but he does it through the means that he has appointed. And so God has given means in your own life. Don't just sit back. Use what God has given you. To glorify him. Another thing that we see within this is that confidence in God's keeping means that we will verbally declare as God gives us opportunity. And that's what he does. You see that multiple times within this text is that, yes, he has confidence in God's keeping of him. But he verbally declares as God gives him the opportunity to do that. Look at verse 23. In verse 23 says, for this very night there stood before me an angel of the God of whom I belong and whom I worship. You notice there the angel's promise. When, when God encouraged Paul through the angel's promise, Paul didn't keep it to himself. He goes on to share and to make everyone know that God was going to save them. Paul didn't keep it to himself. He, he didn't make everyone think that he was just a positive person, that they, they should all keep a positive outlook as, as well. No, he, he speaks of, of what was happening in verse 24. And do not be afraid. Paul, you're going to stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart. 
So he didn't just, he didn't just keep it to himself. He then goes and stands up and says, hey, listen, men. I received the word from the Lord. And here's the word. You can be encouraged by the word. Also, when he encouraged them all to eat some bread, right? We said this just a minute ago. He prays and thanks God openly and, and publicly. He knew they were pagans, but it didn't matter. The point is, is that in times of trial, people are especially open to spiritual things. When, when life is out of control and nothing seems to, to be working, people are open to hear about a God who is in control. And we need to be a people who declare that. We, we should not hesitate to, to be bold to tell them about the true and living God and the eternal life that he offers them through his son, Jesus Christ. We should notice the, that people around us are going through difficulty, going through storms, that, that we are listening, that we hear their struggle, and that we can speak into their struggle. That's part of what Paul does here. And so God will use your trust in him to impact others. God will use your trust in him to impact others. That's what God does with Paul. You know, as, as long as men can devise human ways of coping with the storm uh, apart from God, they will do so. These sailors had heard Paul's testimony that God would deliver them all, but they were going to use their own ingenuity to save themselves, their own experience. You know what? God has only one way of salvation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He won't let people save themselves in their own ways. That is not acceptable to him. He will not let anyone add anything or, or take anything away from his way of salvation. Because Paul trusted God and bore witness to God's promise of deliverance, the other 275 passengers on that ship heard about God. No doubt in the, in the days, in the winter months to follow at Malta, Paul was able to give them a gospel more fully and clearly than he could in the midst of that storm. You know, one man who trusts God in a storm of life can have a major impact on others. That one man focused on God. Focused on the reality of God in his life. And that can and should be us. So this morning, I just want to give you three takeaways that are just simple. Number one, God is good. It's pretty simple. God is good and only does what is good. This is what Psalm 25 verse 8 says. Psalms 25, 8 says that God is good. It says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. God is good. That is because he is holy and he is righteous and he is just. We can trust that whatever he gives us is not a random balancing of the scales. Like you've had some good in your life, so now bad is going to come. But we, we do have to know reality that there is good and bad. There is easy seasons and there is hard seasons. But in both, God is good. He is not an impersonal God who merely works to even out the blessings in our life. Rather, he is the God who gave up every blessing in heaven to take on human flesh and to live in this fallen world so that he could endure the worst suffering on our behalf. How significant is that? And by his blood shed for us, he gives us the greatest blessing of all. Life with him. Eternity with him. God is good. Secondly, God gives out of grace. God gives to you out of grace. To those who trust in Jesus, everything God gives is an overflow of his grace. Whether an answer to a prayer, a hard day, a dream come true, or, or a difficult trial. Remember, in each and every moment of our lives, God gives us whatever we need to make us more like his son. In both blessing and trial, he is refining us. He, he is preparing us for eternity. 
in Romans chapter 5. I'm going to have to turn there. Romans 5, 3 through 5. You're going to have to turn there too. Uh, it might, is it up there? It is up there. It's not back there. So Romans 5, 3 through 5. It says this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Those verses simply say this, that there is a redemptive purpose behind every circumstance we encounter. And all of it is for our good. It builds something up in our life. What does it say there? It builds up endurance and character and hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts so that we will believe, so that we will trust. Paul is a great example in the midst of storms, doesn't give up, doesn't throw in the towel. He trusts God. As maturing believers in Christ, that is expected of us. That is now given to us. We are given these examples for our instruction, for our understanding that that we can go through the storm and and not just to to get upset and not to get, get, get mad and get angry and to walk away, but say, okay, God, why is this storm here? We need to pray. God, how can, I, how can I praise you? How can I serve you? How, how can I encourage others in the midst of this storm? How are you conforming to the image of your son through this storm? What needs to be shed from my life in the midst of this storm? God, I need to trust you. God gives to us out of his grace. And the last takeaway is this, is that God is for us. God is for us. Man, that, that like tickles the ears. That sounds so good. No, that, that's truth. God is for you. God is for Paul, and God is for Luke, and God, God is for Aristarchus, and God had, had a way to protect them and to preserve them and the other passengers on that ship. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is a way, God's way. And God is for us in that way. He is for our good. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world in Ephesians 1.4. He he prepared good works for us to complete. Ephesians 2.10. He saved us while we were yet sinners in in Romans 5. He brought us from death to life through the Spirit. God is for us doing this work and enables us to walk in obedience as Philippians says. Listen, all abundant evidence that He is for us in nothing and no one can stop the good he has for us. In Romans 8, 31 and 32, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how he will not also with him graciously give us all things. If God is for us, God is for you. Have you repented of your sin? Are you clinging to Jesus Christ and him alone? Are you working on your own kingdom or are you in submission to God's kingdom? If we as believers in Christ are in submission to him in full surrender, if we are waving the white flag, God is for us. And so we don't look to do things our own way. We look to do it God's way. And this morning, this text is just a reminder of that. That maybe in our own lives we've been trying to do things our own way and we're, we're frustrated nonstop. Today we need to repent. Repent of our own way and cling to his way. Remember that God is with you in the storm. You're in a storm, it doesn't mean you're out of God's will, it doesn't mean you're out of God's care. You can have incredible confidence that God is keeping you. But even in the confidence that God is keeping you, he still wants you to use your mind. He still wants you to to use wisdom. He still wants you to use the means of what's in your hands to glorify him. Are we doing that? When we think about gospel, may we think about, and I'm saying the church, the body of Christ called gospel. 
May, may we be a people that are saturated in the truths of God's word over and over again. So when we do get kicked over, when, when life does happen and, and we do get kicked over, what spills out is more of truth. It's more of God. It's not our flesh. That's my prayer. Let's pray that together. Our Father, we thank you for the richness of your word. God, that we would be a people of the word, not, not just an easy saying, not, not that we just come up with some, some terms that, that define us, but it's not true of us. God, I pray that, that it would be true of us, that we would be a people that are desperately clinging to you, clinging to your way. And God, I pray this morning there might be some people that are in the midst of a storm, that, that are in the midst of doing life their own way. They've never repented of their sin. They've never looked to you as the hope of all. But this morning, Lord, you know how you're knocking on the door of their own heart. God, I just pray that they would repent and believe the gospel. And Lord, I'm thankful that there's people here that would love to open up the word of God and show them what that's like. And God, I also pray for us as believers that we would be a people that are a great witness and have an incredible impact like Paul in the midst of the storm. That we don't give up, that, that we're not secretive, that, that we don't quit, that we don't do our, our own thing, God, but we trust. We have a confidence in you. You will see us through. It will be for your glory. It will be for our good, and it will impact others. So, Father, I pray this morning that we would just be humble before you. May we humbly confess our sin. May we humbly confess our need for you. May we humbly trust in you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that you are so good. Thank you that you do give us so much out of your grace and kindness. Thank you that you are for us. May we walk out of here being reminded of that, not carrying this for a day, but walking with it every day. God, may we honor you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.